good morning, everyone. I hope you're all recaffeinated. It's a great pleasure to address this global water and food conference and really to be in the presence of so many leaders in this field. Um, I personally believe that a picture is worth a thousand words, and so I hope to give you an encyclopedia of pictures and words in about 35 minutes about the state of our understanding of the science of climate change, and I'm going to draw on the peer-reviewed scientific literature, on verified data, and national and international assessments. So without further ado, here's the outline of the presentation. I want to give you some of the evidence that climate change is occurring and due to humans. I want to talk about the evidence that impacts are already being felt. Then I want to show a bit about what the future portends and end on some of the ways forward. So first, climate change is occurring and is due to human influence. Now, I think every climate science talk has to begin with the requisite greenhouse gas effect chart, so here it is. And there is a, nat a natural greenhouse effect that keeps our planet much warmer and makes life possible on this planet, so that's really good. Uh, there is, uh, it shows on this chart that radiation comes in from the sun in the yellow arrows, and some of it bounces off the earth, and some of it bounces off the atmosphere. But there are a blanket of gases, principally water vapor and carbon dioxide, that trap heat, and those are the red arrows you're seeing, and that warms the Earth about 60 degrees Fahrenheit more than otherwise. However, uh, what's really unfortunate is that we're adding many, many, many more bent red arrows by burning principally carbon-based fuels, and we're adding 9 billion, 9 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere each year. Now, contrary to the press, um, climate change is not new. The physics is very well known. The first papers were published in 1898 by Arrhenius, who argued that adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, a gas that traps heat, would increase the temperature of the planet. And that building a global economy based on carbon-based fuels, coal, oil, and gas, would increase the Earth's temperature. So the physics is well known, and we have known it for well over 100 years. So how do we know what we know about the temperature records of the planet? Well, we actually have many tools to decipher past climate from looking back 100 years to thousands of years to hundreds of thousands of years ago. We can look at growth rates in tree rings. We can look at the concentrations of gases that are contained in the air bubbles in the ice core. We can look at the kinds of pollen and fossils in rocks and in soil. And we can look at coral growth rates. So we can make sense of what past climate has been. And we actually have very much more sophisticated ways to observe current and recent trends in climate. We make literally millions of measurements each year of temperature, of precipitation, of sea level, of regional changes in ecosystems. Um, we measure temperatures through the troposphere and the stratosphere with balloons. We measure temperatures miles down through the ocean column. And with the increasing evidence of the past and current information, the science consensus on climate change has actually gotten very much stronger over the last 20 years. And here I'm showing you the grand concluding sentences of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the world body set up by the United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization. And they produce giant 2,000 page reports every few years. It involves 150 countries, 2,000 scientists. And as you probably know, scientists are not prone to clear declarative sentences. And yet I would argue each of the three sentences in the succeeding reports is pretty clear. So you see in 1995 they said there is a discernible human influence on the climate system. Kind of like we're seeing a human fingerprint, if you will. In 2001, they're saying most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. And finally, in 2007, words like unequivocal were used, very rare among scientists. And also, very likely, which in their parlance means a more than 90% probability that temperature is linked to human greenhouse gas emissions. 
We understand and we can reproduce with our models now the cause and effect relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and temperature. We know carbon dioxide is building up in the atmosphere. World energy is very much dominated by carbon-based fuels, by coal, oil, gas, biomass, and it remains so even today. And so despite all the discussion we have about nuclear and hydro, which in this chart are the top two little slivers, the yellow and the pale blue, they're a very small contribution to the overall world energy picture. And if you look at this chart from 1950 to today, energy use has actually increased about fourfold. And if I were to show you the next century, it could triple again by 2100. So we're adding, as I said, 9 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere today, mostly from the combustion of these fossil fuels and about 15% from deforestation. If energy triples again over the next century and it remains largely carbon-based, we will be in a sea of greenhouse gases. There are other greenhouse gases in addition to carbon dioxide, of course, such as methane, nitrous oxide, black carbon, and those other gases contribute about 25% of the problem, so they're important. But we absolutely cannot confront climate change without seriously tackling carbon dioxide, which is the most important gas. And in relation to the CO2 increasing, the temperatures have been increasing. So <clears throat> on this graph, the right axis shows you CO2. And you can see back in 1880, CO2 was hovering around 275 parts per million in the atmosphere. And that black curve shows it's almost at 400. So that's about a 40% increase of CO2 since 1880 in the atmosphere. And on the left axis, you see in Fahrenheit, <clears throat> the temperature increase. And so temperatures now are about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit or about 0 0.8 degrees Celsius higher than they were in 1880. And if you look though, most of that temperature increase has been since 1980. And despite bumps and wiggles in the temperature record, which reflect the El Ninos and volcanoes and sunspots, there is a clear increase. And again, the tight relationship between CO2 and temperature, especially in the last 30 years. So of the instrumental record, the 15 last years have been the 15 warmest years on record. And the emerging scientific consensus is that the risks of negative impacts are already starting to increase with the relatively modest temperature increase we've seen today. And if we get to two degrees Celsius or about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, Estimates are that perhaps up to 20 to 30% of the world's species could be at risk. Another 1 billion people on the planet could experience severe water stress. We could completely lose tropical glaciers, and those are sources of water supplies for many major cities. We could lose coral reefs, and of course there will be coastal inundation from sea level rise. So I will show you later what it would take to stop at this 2 degrees C, or about 3.6 Fahrenheit. So not only have we detected global warming, but we've also detected regional warming as well, and in the ranges predicted by the models, which gives us increased confidence that the models are reproducing the chemistry and the physics well. So here you see on each continent that they are all showing the um, increases. The black line is the measured temperature, and all of those black lines are inside the model estimates, which is the pink band, and none of those temperatures are inside the blue band, which is what temperatures would be projected if greenhouse gases were not heating the planet. So we have some regional confidence as well. And if we take it to a finer grain and we look at the United States, we're also seeing temperature increases by region. And on this chart, the darkest red temperatures are regions where the temperatures have increased by more than the global average, which as I said is 1.4 degrees to date. And so this breaks out for you the different regions of the country. 
Now, if we, if we go back in time from the ice cores that we have in Antarctica, we have records of temperature and CO2 back more than 800,000 years, almost a million years. And here I'm just showing you the most recent 400,000 years. But as the Earth goes in and out of ice ages, the CO2 goes up and down. And if you see on the, the left of the y-axis there, that's, that range has been about 180 to 280 parts per million of CO2 as we go in and out of ice ages. But today, where the giant red arrow is, the, today the levels in the atmosphere are 398 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, far higher than it's been for hundreds of thousands of years. And heading to, if we continue on business as usual paths, to well more than 600 parts per million, unless the world agrees to much more action than we already have to date. And as you can see, this kind of change is occurring in 100 years, which is a geologic blink of an eye, not 100,000 years, as the cycles I'm showing you there. So if I were gonna sum up all of the 2,000 pages of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, here's how I would do it. They're basically 10 signs that you expect if the Earth is warming. Seven of these should be increasing, and three of these should be decreasing. Five of those seven increasing ones are temperature, sea surface, deep water temperature, temperature over land, temperature in the air, um, but you also expect sea level to be increasing and humidity to be increasing as you're speeding up the water cycle of the planet. The three that should be decreasing are glaciers, snow cover, and sea ice, and all 10 of these are occurring as we would expect if climate change were occurring. And there's real data behind these. Some of these data sets are a little messy. In some cases, we have multiple data sets. Well, in all cases, we have multiple data sets. But here are the um, actual data. And um, as I said, we expect seven increasing ones. Those are the temperature increasing ones there. And the increase in evaporation and humidity are also there. Um, when we increase humidity, when we speed up the water cycle, we are increasing total rainfall on the planet, but we are also increasing evaporation, particularly from the center of continents, which can lead to drought. So you have this paradoxical climate change leads to more overall water, but it can also lead uh, to increased droughts. And the rainfall that does come down from this increased evaporation has tended to come in the very extreme rainfall events. And in fact, every part of the United States now is showing an increase in this region of up to more than 25% of extreme rainfall events. That is the top percentiles of extreme events, more than two inches a day. And here are the ones that are headed down, that's snow cover land-based ice and sea ice. And let's take a quick look at these three, the loss of ice. So losing mass of Greenland and Antarctica and the Arctic is all happening faster than was expected. And this unfortunately is exam an example of a non-linear trend that's really worrisome and many think could lead to a tipping point, a point of no return beyond which this ice disappears. So first, mountain glaciers, they're receding all around the globe. This is the Grinnell Glacier in Glacier National Park in 1900 on the left and in 2000 on the right. I climbed this glacier very painfully um, and you can see there's quite a difference. And as the exposed darker Earth appears, it's absorbing more heat than the reflective cover used to, and so that enhances the warming on lands. In fact, we really might soon need to rename Glacier National Park because there are only 26 glaciers left out of the 150. <clears throat> Greenland, huge land-based ice sheet. We're seeing very rapid melt of Greenland. The orange areas are the areas that were melting on the left in 1992, in the middle in 2002, and then in 2007. Our physics models did not predict this incredible increase in melt rate. And I would argue this is an example of uncertainty in the science that can cut the wrong way, as in what we didn't know can lead to a much greater impact than in fact we thought. So sea level has already doubled from about 1.7 millimeters a year to 3.4 millimeters a year, and that's happened in the last few decades. And increasingly, this seems to now be somewhat attributable to the massive melt in Greenland. In fact, last year, the entire surface of Greenland was melting in July. The whole map was orange, and that's something that, as far as we know, has actually never happened before. 
As you know, if Greenland were to melt, it holds seven meters, or about 21 feet of sea level rise. And no doubt you've heard a whole lot about the Arctic floating sea ice melting at prodigious rates. And now floating sea ice won't contribute to sea level rise when it melts, but we may have an ice-free Arctic very soon, and it's creating all kinds of interesting national security issues and trade issues as the Northwest Passage will become routinely passable, who owns the seafloor, um, and the loss of ice here again creates a dark surface, and then that dark water absorbs heat rather than reflects it, and amplifies the warming. So this was the summer ice cover in 1980, and here it is last year. And you can see last year both the Northeast and the Northwest Passage were open. In fact, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of State, the National Science Foundation, and the Pentagon are going to meet soon to discuss the possibility of an ice-free summer Arctic, which now appears possible to occur in a few years, not a few decades, as we thought as recently as in the year 2000. Okay, so there's all these expected and occurring physical changes, the seven up and three down, but so what? The physical changes are causing impacts and they're already being felt by society. So that changing temperature, speeding up the water cycle, increasing precipitation, increasing drought, and the rising sea level, both from the melting of land-based ice and the thermal expansion of water, are changing the ideal range where everything can live, where forests, where crops, where pests. And it's also affecting the timing, the quality, and the quantity of water. And all these things are happening simultaneously. So we do have independent proof that climate is changing. Spring is coming, <laughs> may not seem true this year, but one to two weeks earlier. And we have evidence of this from monitoring 75 botanical gardens all around the earth in terms of when first leaf out occurs. Um, we're also seeing that uh, the crops are moving or plants are moving. The ideal range to grow particular crops is shifting in response to the changing temperatures. We're seeing increased heat. Record highs have been broken around the globe. And in the last few decades, extreme heat events have actually doubled. So record summer temperatures just in the last couple years were in Southern Europe, in India, in Russia, and in Japan. And as you probably have heard, 2012 was the warmest year for the United States ever recorded. And so we have heat, but that's also increasing the evaporation of water, drought, as I said, especially in the interior con of in interiors of continents have been increasing. And every year for probably the last 20, droughts have cost the United States some, I don't know, maybe 10 to $12 billion. But this last year's drought is certain to be two to three times more expensive because 60% of the United States was in drought. And we've seen food crises in many parts of the world in recent years, which, which helps show how fragile our food distribution systems are and how we're gonna need to attend to that going forward. And I know we're gonna hear a lot more about that uh, at this Congress. Pests, the warmer, wetter weather is helping all sorts of pesky invasives, ranging from mosquitoes to ants to ticks to molds to avian flu to West Nile virus to increase their range. And they're no longer held in check, for example, as kudzu was by frost lines. So we have now about 25,000 data sets, each of these sets more than a decade in duration, showing that physical and ecological impacts are occurring in concert with climate change. Here's where we have those data sets. The physical information, the physical changes are shown by these orange icons, and the ecological changes are shown by in the maroon icons. And as you can see, these long-term changes have been observed virtually everywhere. A little closer to home, um, this map from the Department of Agriculture shows how the plant growth hardiness regions have shifted only in 22 years. And these zones, the hardiness zones, are based on the coldest cold, and, and each zone is about a 10 degree Fahrenheit difference. So if you look at the green zones, the light and the dark green zones, zones five, dark green, zone six, light green, you can see that those green bands have shifted about 120 miles just in this short time frame. 
So we're finding that states like Georgia can now grow uh, tropical firebush, and here in Nebraska, you can certainly grow dogwoods and service berries. So we're seeing that plants are actually shifting in response to the changing temperature, changing um, precipitation regimes, and they're moving latitudinally towards the poles and altitudinally up mountains. And the future models project that plants to keep up with the shifting climate map would have to move up to 45 feet a day, uh, 15 meters, that's about four to 10 times what we've ever seen in the fossil record. And so people are beginning to think about, uh, do we have to sort of think about becoming Johnny Appleseed so that we can plant ahead and keep the trees and crops we want in the new latitude to which they will be appropriate? We've already seen in the US that the Midwest and New England are losing uh, maple trees to Canada with uh, impacts on our maple syrup and our pancake breakfast, but the plants appear to be on the move. Um, and I mentioned that unwanted plants are thriving already, unfortunately, for her sufferers like myself. The ragweed season is two weeks longer, um, especially here in the Midwest and the Great Plains region. And we're seeing that ragweed pollen heads are already 30% bigger. Poison ivy is getting growing better, and the compound that almost all of us are allergic to, urushiol, is becoming more potent within those plants. So one common argument that a warmer, wetter world is going to be a greener world uh, may have some credibility, but the plants that do best may benefit allergists but may not feed the world. We're also seeing that people are being affected by heat. And there's new research by NASA showing that very extreme heat, street, uh, three standard deviations, or something that should occur only perhaps one in a thousand year events, have become 20 to 100 times more prevalent in the last 30 years. The map on the right is the map of the fatalities from the heat wave in Europe that, as you will recall, killed 35,000 people in a relatively rich part of the world. And on the bar chart on the left, I'm just showing you some of the temperatures that were set in recent years. In Pakistan, 128 degrees Fahrenheit, Sudan, 121, Bolivia, 116, Russia, 114, and even Finland, 99 degrees Fahrenheit. This past year was the hottest year on record in the U.S., and in total, 30,000 high temperature records were broken in the United States. It's just amazing. And you can see that some parts of the Midwest here, the darker oranges, had 2012 annual temperatures that were between 4 and 6 degrees Fahrenheit above average. And we were in incredible drought, as you know, 60% of the country. And so the heat and the drought were really a double whammy for our crops. In fact, in January, fully 96% of Nebraska was in extreme or exceptional drought. And for Nebraska, this was absolutely the warmest and driest year ever recorded, um, with great consequences. I mean, this is a river in southwest Nebraska, and it's at zero flow. This is the Republican River. And obviously, the severe drought in the US, this is another picture from Blair, Nebraska in July, the severe drought affected grain prices and really reverberated around the world. But this is a picture of the drought last year in Sahel, an equally severe drought. And there's some new information that's coming out. The New England Complex Systems Institute has linked riots in the last decade that have occurred in countries like Egypt, Yemen, Cameroon, Iraq, and Tunisia with very rapid food price increases related to drought and warns that we may actually, in the aftermath of this very severe last drought year, experience as famine spreads uh, riots in different parts of the world. Extreme events of all types are increasing. First, I'm going to show for the United States here, the colors represent the number of billion dollar events over the last 30 years. And so across the top, I'm showing you droughts, tropical storms, winter storms, second row, flooding, wildfires, and severe local storms. And again, showing you no region is immune. The reds and the darkest red are the highest number of these billion dollar events in each category. But if you just look at the two leftmost upper and lower map, you can see both droughts and floods 
in uh, the Midwest and the Great Plains region have been increasing. If you take this kind of look to a global picture, here's what Munich Ray has put together. And again, global catastrophes are increasing. So this is the number of events over the last 30 years. It starts in 1980. Only the red part of these bars is not climate related. So the red part, the very bottom part, is earthquakes and volcanoes. But the green represents storms, the blues flooding, the yellows droughts and fires. And so at the beginning of this time, you see that in the mid 80s, there were the numbers of events hovered around 400, they rose to about 600, and now they're routinely more than 800 worldwide. And in fact, there were 900 such events last year. So where were those 900 events? Here's how they were distributed spatially. And again, you can see everywhere. Uh, remember again, only the red ones are not weather related. The size of the circle relates to the number in that region. Again, blues, floods, green storms, yellow droughts and fires. And for much of the world that is developing, these disasters were not insured. However, some of the losses are insured, um, and the five costliest events for the insurance industry this year were all in the United States. And here you see Hurricane Sandy, drought, severe storms, severe storms, severe storms. So these are impacts that we have already seen at the temperature increase of about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 0.8 degrees Celsius. And the question now is, so what does the future portend? Well, business as usual will take us well past what the science community has called kind of a, a two degree C guardrail or a 3.6 degree Fahrenheit guardrail. And many governments and science bodies, including the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, have called for avoiding going above this temperature. But here's where the models project temperatures are gonna go in the coming century. And as you can see on the right Y axis, up to four degrees, um, on the left axis, up to four degrees C, or on the right axis, more than seven degrees Fahrenheit. And that part before the year 2000, you know, looks like a pretty flat temperature trend now, but that's basically the temperature trend I showed you before that showed you how, um, how striking the increase was for the last 30 years. So looking forward at those model projections, it may be that we ain't seen nothing yet, that the rate of increase in temperature and the total increase in temperature will be significantly more than what we've seen today. So what would that mean to how things feel? Here's a projection of how the number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit will increase under a low emission scenario, which is the orange bars, and the high emission scenario, which are the red bars. So maybe just look at the last pair of bars in each graph for the end of the century. And if you look for the Great Plains region, you could see that this region could have more than a month of over 100 degree days by mid-century. What will this mean for water? Water shortages will definitely increase. Um, red is the more problematic area, again. So the map on the bottom shows you today's water availability and problems. And in the bottom map, about 10% of the US counties uh, have water problems in any given year. But you see by the upper map a trebling of that, or at least 30% of the counties routinely will be at risk of water shortages. One of the key concerns for future impacts, as we've already heard this morning, of course, is damage to agriculture. And as Jeff Rakes noted, especially in the tropics and in developing countries where their economies are much more reliant on agriculture than most of the developed world. And as this World Bank graphic shows, um, the red areas are places where agricultural productivity loss could exceed 50% by 2030. And this is ju not just one crop. This is a composite of 12 major crops of wheat, of rice, of maize, of millet, of sweet potatoes, of soybeans, and several oil crops. Um, so again, the darkest reds are principally in the countries that are already subject to famine and to drought. And even in some of the wealthier countries, if we look at where irrigation water is expected to increase in blue or decrease in red, we can see that some of the wealthy countries quite dependent on irrigation now, that needed water supply will decrease going forward as these yellow circles show. 
In the future, we will expect more heat waves. And so I showed you the anomalous, the then anomalous 2003 heat wave in Europe. And here it's shown as a little star there with the blue arrow. But that temperature is projected to become the normal temperature, if you look at the arrow for 2040. And the 2003 heat wave temperature will become cool by 2060. Going forward, it's likely that we will have more environmental refugees, a, a term that actually the UN does not have a real definition for, nor an, an exact idea of how to deal with them. But if you look at the blue dots on this map, where I've plotted all the cities of more than a million people, and then you look at the yellow and, yellow and red coastal areas, which are particularly fragile, a rising sea level of up to three feet by the end of the century, which is now quite probable, or one meter, will put lots of people and infrastructure at risk where those blue cities and yellow and red coastlines intersect. And so, for example, while we know climate sea level rise and variability already affects an area like Bangladesh, a sea level rise of another, one to one and a half meters, will put 17 million people at risk and 16% of their land area at risk. That same amount of sea level rise, uh, to bring it home, would flood Miami and a third of the Everglades, which you will recall we're spending about $8 billion a year to replumb right now, and it will increase saltwater intrusion of many, many water systems. And I think, you know, we know, at least here in the United States, an issue has arrived when it appears in the sports literature. And Sports Illustrated recently noted that seven pro sports stadiums in Florida would also be underwater with one meter sea level rise, which they indicated was a bad thing. <laughs> so our infrastructure, our ecosystems, our drinking water, and our sports are all jeopardized by climate change. So let's just spend a few minutes on the ways forward. What would it take to be on a low carbon pathway to keep the world's temperature from exceeding by a lot, two degrees C or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit and beyond? Um, instead of being on the topmost line, the business as usual line with that arrow heading straight out, uh, we would want to be on that bottom arrow line, which is the uh, two, two degree trajectory, which is the 3.6 degree Fahrenheit. So it, it's, in order to do this, we would absolutely globally have to fundamentally transform our energy systems. And all the models say, these are some of the wedges you could do to take you from that top line down to that bottom line. First and foremost, use the energy, uh, use energy efficiency, that's the big red wedge. Use the energy in our cars, our buildings, our industry, our power plants more efficiently. You take, lop off that red wedge. Then you need an, the orange wedge, which is the next generation of renewables, which is solar, wind, and biofuels. The next wedge, the yellow wedge, is assuming nuclear continues to play at least a modest role. All the models seem to feel this is necessary. The fourth wedge, the big dark blue wedge, is carbon capture sequestration, or taking the carbon out of burning fossil fuels and stuffing it underground or in the oceans and depleted oil wells and saline aquifers. Yes, that is energy intensive, but that allows you a way to continue burning fossil fuels. And then not insignificant are the rest of those wedges. The dark green is storing more carbon in our forests, in our landscapes. The light green is going after other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. And the very last wedge, which is happening a bit, obviously now, is switching from coal to gas. But you need this huge portfolio of technologies to, by 2050, even be on the beginning of that path that heads seriously down. We need very rapid penetration of technologies that we do have. We need significant investments in the next generation, but we are not on this lower path in terms of either deploying existing technologies nor investing more than about $70 billion in public R&D globally to try to transform the energy systems of the world, which are worth something like $15 trillion in terms of standing stock. 
uh, nor have the countries of the world made commitments to actually uh, take us onto that path. The hope is the UN Convention on Climate Change has agreed that there will be binding negotiations in 2015 with um, reductions to hit by 2020 to begin to seriously change that trajectory. So that is the next big international negotiation with all countries participating. So it's clear that we absolutely have to damp the rate of growth of greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. But I would argue increasingly, we need to adapt or cope with the changes that are already underway and more that is in store. And as we heard in the previous panel, this absolutely requires involving stakeholders to both understand the risks and to develop feasible and societally acceptable options to be able to implement them. We have to monitor the impacts, we have to review best practices, and we have to continually revise the strategy. So we're gonna to have to adapt, and we're gonna to have to adapt adaptively. And, and I like to say, I think we need to reduce emissions enough to avoid that which is unmanageable, and we need coping mechanisms to manage that which is unavoidable. So clearly we are not, as you have heard, and we'll hear more of, dealing with extreme events well today and more is in store. So we really need, I think, to step up our efforts on preparedness and adaptation. Not so much on reactive adaptation, which is what we're doing now, but getting ready and have uh, prepared or anticipatory adaptation. For, for a very long time, the word adaptation was sort of like the scarlet A word that people were not willing to talk about because it implied you were giving up on mitigation. However, I think it's absolutely clear that we need both now. So too little has happen, happened in the nascent field of adaptation, huge research, planning and management agenda, and we really need to get on with it. And here are some of the things I think we need. We need to think about infrastructure that can withstand the new 100-year floods and droughts. We need crops that perform well in the summers like we just had, as well as in wetter, cooler ones. We need to figure out how to better protect people and livestock from heat stress. We have to improve preparedness and response to floods, to droughts, to storms. We have to share practices that work with other communities. We need better monitoring and we have to conduct periodic assessments to figure out what we know, what we need to know, and how to develop that information in a timely way to help managers and decision makers make wise events, make wise decisions. The, the recent spate of extreme events, I think, has made this only too clear. And here are some reports that I would recommend you might want to look at for some early thinking on this. So I wanted to actually close by reiterating the urgency, especially to developing countries. And, and I think this picture of Bola Island in Bangladesh is really worth a thousand words. It's clear there's no time to delay. And my very final words and pictures come from the children of the planet. And here are some of their thoughts on the future they see as possible. And I would say, as Maria Kasabian said, it is our collective responsibility to find unselfish solutions and fast before it's too late to reverse the damage caused every day. Thank you very much. Thank you.